Did you believe that this morning, church? He is great and mighty. You can make your way to your seats and be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to invite you to one of those books in the Bible that when you hear the title of the book, immediately, for some reason, we've been taught traditionally for a, a sigh oh, to come up in us. But the more we have been reading the Bible over the course of the last few months as a church family, the more I am convinced that the Apostle Peter, under inspiration, said every word of God is for our learning and for our admonition, which would tell us theologically that there are no words that are unimportant to God. Does that make sense? This is not called the thoughts of God, the ideas of God, the stories of God, the history of God. It's called for a purpose, the Word of God, because words are impacting. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And God gives us some stuff in the Bible that if we are not extraordinarily cautious and careful, we will haphazardly read over, if not totally ignore, because number one, it either makes us uncomfortable, or number two, we don't quite understand it. So I want you to go to one of those books this morning, and that book happens to be First Chronicles. Would you go there, please? First Chronicles chapter 4 is where we'll take our text for just the next little bit, and I want to give you some things that the Lord's laid upon my heart. I want to build uh, the story just a little bit in a moment. But this is, for some people, a passage that is extraordinarily familiar. For some of you, this will be a first-time opportunity for you to go past this. But since we already prayed a moment ago, I'm going to just go ahead and jump right in. So if you're in the habit of timing preachers, you can go ahead and start your watch, although I'll not pay any attention to it. I'm going to do what the Bible tells me to do today, all right? Now listen, we in December decided as a church family that we were going to read the Bible in an entire month. For some reason, the Twitter verse had a theological meltdown, and people began to say silly things like this. Well, you know, I, I just feel like when I read the Bible, I need to study it and take my time. And so then I let people know that we weren't just going to read the Bible as a church family in the book of December, but we were also going to read uh, every single chapter of the Bible every single month in 2024. And literally give us 13 opportunities to go through the Word of God. Now, again, if you've mashed the gas and you're far ahead of me and everyone else, that's fine. I don't care if you are months behind. The facts are people that call themselves followers of Jesus do not read the Bible. That's just the lukewarm facts of where we are. People don't read the Bible. And the people that don't read the Bible say things like this. Well, I think you are just reading it too fast. I like to study and digest it. And I'm like, yeah, you read Psalm 23 like six months ago and not done anything for you yet, right? The, the only people that have given us a hard time about marathon reading the Bible are the people that, in fact, do not read the Bible. Because anybody that would tell you you can have too much of the Word of God doesn't even have a little bit of who and what Jesus really is in their life. Because you cannot have too much of the Word of God. The problem in this woke, sissified church in America is that we have no Word of God in these churches. That's why it's no holes bar. That's why the alphabet cult has taken over. That's why wokeness has taken over. Uh, that's why foolishness has taken over. And that's why when you go to the average church, it is dry as cracker juice. There is no power. And the preacher gets up and preaches a cute little story, but he doesn't have enough Holy Ghost infusement to blow the fuzz off a small peanut, and you know it to be true. We've all seen it. And by the way, our church has been there, done that, and by the grace of God, we're not going back to that nonsense. So yes, the Bible is entirely important, and so the more I read it, the more it starts making sense. But you have to read it. Joshua 1 8 this book not another book, but this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth But thou shalt meditate therein day and night notice that day and night not once a month Not whenever you feel like it You know, what's interesting. I could get up and say things about the Bible that are entirely not true as a lot of pastors do and People would sit there take notes and amen and think it's in the Word of God the whole time You better not take face value what Greg Locke says you better get your nose out of the newspaper and stick it in the Word of God and see what Jesus has to say 
And so the more Bible I read, the more I want to read, the more I understand, the more I want to understand, and the more I learn, the more I realize, holy smokes, I am an infant spiritually. An absolute infant. You know, you get some of these people, they get that big old family-sized Bible, tuck it under the arm. It's the only time they hold it, and they show up at church, and they're all that, and then some, look at me. I am magnificent in the eyes of the Lord. You know what you don't do? You don't read the Bible, because when you read the Word of God, it'll humble you. You won't walk around with a big head. You'll walk around with a huge heart for the things of God. And the more we've been on this journey together, I'm thinking to myself, holy smokes alive, why did we not start this journey earlier? Now, again, it's not a pastoral rat race as to see who can read the Bible more. But it is shocking to me just when in this tent... During the storm and losing half the tent and during my two-week sickness and during travels and everything that we had to rearrange, you do realize that we still read out loud in this tent from this altar, from this platform, the entire Word of God, all right? 31,101 verses, 1,189 chapters, 791,328 words, and we did it in only 19 sittings, and only two of the sittings were between six to eight hours. Most of them were between two to four hours. Don't tell me you don't have time to read the Word of God. You got all the time you want, you just don't want to. So all of that to set the platform to say that in the book of First Chronicles, there's some I don't want to verses because it's these huge multisyllabic King James names that even with the pronunciation key, we have a hard time to develop and to say. And when we were reading out loud, you see, it's one thing in your private time to read the Word of God. You can say C-man begat G-man and M-man begat O-man and Z-man. You can do that, right? Cheddar man. You can make up some names. But when you're reading it out loud in a room full of people and online, you got to at least be as meticulous as you can. And I'm here to tell you, some of them names is like falling down a flight of steps. Because after you fail, you get up and dust yourself off, and you're like, whoa, thanks be unto God, that is over with, right? And that's the way we feel sometimes when we approach these chapters. Now, I say that to say something that's very important. By the time you get to chapter 4 of 1 Chronicles, where we're going to be in just a moment, we're going to pick up in verses 9 and 10. But by the time you get to verse number 9, do you know how many verses have been mentioned Without explanation or exposition, 141 verses. Jot that down, 141 verses from 1 Chronicles 1.1 1, 1 to 1 Chronicles 4 and verse 8. That's 141 verses of nothing but two things, names of people and names of locations that we probably couldn't even find on the map. Then after he deals with chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, with one very specific individual, he then goes back, and once again, there are hundreds of verses all the way until chapter 13. Name after name after name. This one married this one. This one begot this one. This one reigned in the stead of this one. This one went to this town. This one went to this town. This one split that town and made five more towns. And Duke this and Duke that and King this and Queen that. And sometimes we can read this and we're like, wow, what are you trying to teach me? He's trying to teach us that words in the Bible are important. Now, I don't have time to develop this. I'm going to take a Wednesday night in the not-too-distant future, and I'm going to preach just a whole message, it'll take me a little while, and it will not be exhaustive, but I'm going to preach a whole message on things that I've learned reading the Bible this much and this fast that I did not know for 30 years of preaching the Bible. Is that fair? I mean, I'm finding out some crazy stuff in the Bible. And by the way, names happen to be some of the issues that the Holy Spirit's downloading to my spirit. I had no idea. I told the men this in our Bible study a couple of weeks ago. I had no idea, for example that there was a girl in the Bible named Noah. Had no idea. I thought there was one Noah, that was it. I know a guy, right? That's the only thing I thought about Noah. Five of you got that. But nonetheless, there's a girl in the Bible. Her father was named Zapolopid. What a name. Zapolopid. You know how many times Noah the girl is mentioned in the Bible? Four. 
Four times. And all we think of is Noah and the flood. And I'm like, man, I had no idea that there was a girl in the Bible named Noah after Noah because of who he was and what God had done in his life. Tell you something else about names I didn't know. I had no idea. Now, you're looking at a guy who's been preaching for a long time, right? I had no idea that David, King David, had a son that he named Nathan. Can I remind you who Nathan was to David? He was the prophet that showed up after a year of non-repentance, walked into the king chamber, took his long, bony, evangelistic finger, stuck it right in King David's face and said, let me tell you something, bucko, you are the man. And that was not an accolade. You have sinned against God. But here's what's interesting. The Bible says that David and Bathsheba conceived a child. The child was born. It lived for a certain amount of days, got extraordinarily sick for seven days, and on the seventh day, God allowed it to die. David got up, ate, washed himself, stopped fasting. His servants came to him and said, Wow, while the baby was sick, you wouldn't even eat. You laid around in sackcloth and ashes, but now that the baby has died, now you've washed yourself, closed yourself, changed yourself, now you're eating. What, what gives? We don't understand. He said, Look, while the child was still alive, was it not right for me to come before the Lord and see if God would have grace and mercy because of my repentance? But now that the child is gone, I can go to him, but he can never again come to me. And I thought to myself, that's a very interesting story until I read later in the Bible and found out that the child born in Jerusalem just before Solomon came from Bathsheba was a child by the name of Nathan. The child Nathan that died was named after Nathan that predicted it was going to happen. And I have preached the Bible for 30 plus years and never made that divine connection. Now maybe you made it 50 years ago. But you see what happens when you read the Bible the way you're supposed to read the Bible. Things start happening. Names start making sense. I'll give you one more, right? I'm in no hurry. When you get to the New Testament, you have 28 chapters called the book of Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. Matthew was a man that was a Jew that worked for the Roman government. And nobody then or now, 2,000 years later, really likes tax collectors. Can I get a witness? But you know something I never noticed about not just the name, but the calling of Matthew. It's 28 chapters. We always say things like this. Well, you know, these men were eyewitnesses. Some of them were. Not all of them were eyewitnesses. Because Jesus said in the book of John, chapter 16, the words which I speak unto you, you shall remember them when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You see, that's divine dictation. That's, that's a, they were divine secretaries. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Even if they didn't see it, the Holy Spirit told them exactly what to write. That's why we believe in the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Scriptures. Amen? That's a whole other message. Don't get me started on that. Praise God. We'll be here till five. <coughs> and some of you would sit. But listen, it's interesting. Something I never noticed. Never noticed because we read so fast. Did you know that Matthew, in 28 chapters, Matthew was not called to be a follower of Jesus until the end of Matthew chapter 9. Let that sink in for a minute. That means everything that was written from chapter 1 to his calling at the end of chapter 9 was not written from memory and eyewitness account. He had to go back and write the first nine chapters of what happened in the ministry of Jesus, having never yet even been called by the ministry of Jesus. He did not even follow Jesus until almost 10 chapters into the book that bears his name. You talk about divine inspiration. That's why I don't care what these atheists and agnostics and silly woke crowd says. The word of God is supremely inspired every jot and every tittle. When you and I and our pea-sized brains are cold, dead, six feet in the ground, and the world's on fire, the Bible will still stand like the rock of Gibraltar. It'll still stand. 
Heaven and earth may pass away, but my words, he said, shall not pass away. So it's important, and I think I've built the case, that you pay attention to the words that are in the Bible. So after 141 verses, and then to go right back into chapters and chapters of verses and recognize the fact that these 141 verses have multiple names of people and cities, some upwards of eight names in one verse, some only two or three. So we're talking about thousands of people in the context of 141 verses and thousands more in the context of verse 11 all the way up through chapter 13. That's a lot of folks. That's a big family reunion. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of places. That's a lot of stuff. But in the midst of all of it, God does the remarkable. He takes one man that no one ever talks about ever again in the confines of Scripture. He pulls him out of a historical account of thousands of people that have no description of their life. Any description that's given of these people will be something like this. So-and-so was a mighty hunter. So-and-so was an artist. That's it. Says nothing about their life. Says nothing about their past, their present, or their future for thousands of names. And then one simple Odd-named individual, Jabez. Theologically, and pops out of the chronology of Scripture, and we read through this thing to ourselves, yeah, this one we got, this one, this one, Jabez, this one we got. And we miss the golden nuggets that are contained in the gold mine of God's Word. And because we want to either quickly read the Bible or not at all read the Bible, but criticize those who do, we miss what God's trying to teach us. You see me going slow this morning? It's important. I'm not interested in barn burning, preaching the paint off the side of the tent as if there were paint on it. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm getting my personality out of it because you need to see the flow of what the Holy Spirit's trying to teach you. And the first thing he's trying to teach you is you better get in the Word of God and pay attention to it. The reason a lot of people don't want to read the Bible is because the Bible is a book that when you read it, it will read you. It'll convict you of your sin. It'll convict you of your fornication. It'll convict you of your pornography. It'll convict you of your lying. It'll convict you of your shady business deals. And people are like, well, you know, I'd rather just not read the Bible because it, it convicts me. It should. The Bible should make you extraordinarily uncomfortable when you read it for many reasons. But notice, if you would please, what happens in 1 Chronicles chapter 4. And look, please, at verse number 9. In the middle of all of this, in the midst of name, 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 place, place, place. This man pops out of obscurity. And Jabez, shout Jabez. Jabez. Now look at me for a moment. Let me tell you what the word Jabez means. It means painful one or one who brings sorrow to others. He's not doing well right out of the gate. You see, my name has a meaning. Your name has a meaning. In our American vernacular and in our Western mentality, the meaning of our names to us is not really logically that important. It should be. But in every other country of the world, especially when you go to a Middle Eastern country, it is not your name that is important. It is the meaning behind your name that is important. So if you were born into royalty, your name would exemplify that. If you were born on the other side of the tracks into poverty, your name would exemplify that. If you were born into infirmity, sickness, disease, handicap, deformity, your name oftentimes would exemplify that. Your name was not nearly as important as the definition behind your name, what your name meant. Can you imagine this kid on his playground? Oh, there's the painful one. Oh, there's the one that brings sorrow and grief to others. Uh, there's that, as we would say, loser. Uh, there's that man that will never amount to anything. Can you imagine the accumulative word curses that were placed upon Jabez when he was just a kid simply because of his name, not because of his actions? So it's important that you understand what the name means. So watch this, verse 9. And Jabez was more honorable than his brethren. Obviously, he had some family. He had some brothers. And his mother called his name, here's the word again, Jabez, saying, meaning by that, here's the reason I named you this. 
Here's the reason you get this deplorable name. Because I bear him with, notice the next word, sorrow. Here is a man that right out of the gate, literally right out of the womb, has a name that looks to us as if he will never amount to a, as the old timers say, hill of beans. What a loser. What a deplorable individual. His mother said, oh, I've got other sons, and you're just an insurance liability. I've got other children. You're just another mouth to feed. You're just a problem. You are unloved. You are unwanted. You are unaccepted. Now, here's what we do not know. We have no idea where his father is in the context, but he is purposely not mentioned. And so now here is this, shall I say, without taking too many liberties, single mom, as far as we can, are concerned. Who maybe the father died in a battle, maybe he's a deadbeat dad and just walked out the door, but regardless, here is a young man that is born into a family that immediately does not want him and with great hesitation names him something that would go down in infamy as here is a man that will never amount to anything. You ever felt like that? You don't have to raise your hand because we're on a live stream, but I wonder how many of you grew up in a home where your parents or your grandparents would say things like this. Nobody's ever really going to love you. You're just a failure. By the way, the spirit of failure is a real demon. You know that? We see people delivered from it on a very regular basis. They say, well, you know, you're, you're, you're just fat. You're ugly. You've got crooked teeth. You're stupid. You have no education. God will never use you. You'll never make money. You're going to be, here's what I heard my whole life, you're going to be just like your dad, and you're going to prison. By the way, you start believing that nonsense, you'll start projecting that nonsense in your life because when you wear on you what everybody else says you are, you'll eventually start looking like everybody says you should look. And Jabez could have given every excuse under the sun. Well, you know, I was named Jabez, and so I'm just going to be a, you know, I'm, going, I'm just going to chill in the prison yard for the rest of my life. He could have gave every excuse in the world, which, by the way, if he was in this culture, he would. What a mamby-pamby, blame-shifting culture we live in. Young people have no respect for not one person because they have no respect for their own person. And we want to blame everybody. Well, you know, yeah, let me tell you the reason I am the way that I am. I'm from, you know, I'm from a dysfunctional family. So I get a pass. Let me tell you something, bucko. We're all from dysfunctional families. <laughs> Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so then death passed upon all men, Romans 5, 12. For they all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Adam and Eve jacked it up for everybody. We all come from dysfunction. We all come from dysfunction. Hey, guys, give me a little bit more in the house. I can tell my voice still ain't completely better. And this guy could have given every excuse, like so many people that we see. Well, you know, it's, it's so-and-so's fault. Remember what Adam said? It's a woman you gave me. Remember what the woman said? It's the snake that you put in the garden. And everybody always wants to shift the blame. Matter of fact, anybody ever visited a prison? Better. Anybody ever been in jail? Stick your hands up. Yep, it's Global Vision. I figured so. Okay, now. <coughs> If you talk to a hundred prisoners about what they did, 99 of them will tell you, what my fault? It was something. Nobody wants to take responsibility or accountability. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, because sentence against an evil matter is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do naught. Meaning by that, if you don't punish evildoers, evildoers get worse with their evil doings. Years ago, I mean, this was far before Facebook and X and all that kind of stuff and TikTok. I was at the Greater Rhode Island Baptist Temple in Providence, Rhode Island. And this lady showed up and she said, uh, I work for such and such a radio station and we would like to interview you live tonight before you preach on the radio, right? This was back when cassette tapes were like a real thing. And some of you kids are like, what's a cassette tape? Exactly. But nonetheless... 
she set me down in this little stool and she said, now, we're not going to really coach you. And this was long before I knew anything about doing live videos and all that kind of stuff, right? And she said, I'm not going to coach you. I'm just going to ask you a few questions about the Bible and about politics. And this was like way before I even got involved in the whole political scene, right? And so I'm like, okay. So she's going on and on and on and on and on. And she gets to this one question. And she says, I need to ask you a question. She said, do you believe in the electric chair? And I said, oh, no, ma'am. I believe in the electric couch, 10 at a time. And when I said that, <laughs> her eyes got big around as Jimmy Dean saw it. She's like, cut him off, cut him off, cut him off, cut him off. <laughs> but I say all that to say that people don't want to take responsibility for their actions. And Jabez could have been one of these little mealy mouth people in his culture that said, well, you know, I didn't have a dad. I didn't grow up with a mom that loved me. My brothers bullied me. Yada, 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 shmada. Your excuses have kept you where you are. There is nothing in your life that you have not yet accomplished that hasn't left you there because of an excuse you gave for why you can't do it. An excuse is nothing more than a lie with the skin of a reason stretched around it. And Jabez could have given every excuse. I can't. I don't have enough money. My name is Jabez. I'm just full of sorrow. I'm full of bitter. Yada, 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 yada. You need deliverance. Stop all that self-pity. Well, you just don't know what they said. I know. Nor do I care. You know why? Because the Bible says in Ephesians 4.32, as God forgave you for Christ's sake, so you forgive them no matter what they said, no matter what they did. Peter said, how often shall I forgive my brother that offends against me? Shall I do it seven times? And Jesus said, I know that sounds so spiritual, but what you ought to do is 490 times. Now, let me help you with something. That doesn't mean you get a journal <laughs> and a ballpoint pen and you start taking daily notes. Oh, we at 395. Woo! We have four and 89. One more and I can bust you in the mouth. He's not saying keep record. What he's saying is stop keeping record. That's the whole point. It's an innumerable amount. We just forgive, 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 forgive. Why does forgiveness flow through us? Because forgiveness flowed to us. That's a word right there. So Jabez could have made all these excuses. My dad, my mom, my brother, my surroundings, whatever. But I want to show you something before we get into the meat of the matter. And again, it's something I had never seen before. Something I'd never paid attention to because when you get into this one, to that one, to this one, to that one, to this one, and 52 more just like them, sometimes you can go blurry and you can check out. Don't check out when you're reading the Bible. Don't check out. Check in. Did you know that Jabez is never again after this mentioned by anybody in the Bible? It's interesting. He doesn't get a sentence. He gets two full verses in a chronology of people that got one mention. They got a participation trophy. They got an honorable mention amongst thousands, if not tens of thousands of people and places. Jabez got two whole verses, and then right after that, it goes right back into the next person. You know how many people Jesus quoted in the New Testament? Think about that. He talked about all types of Old Testament people. He talked about Elijah. He talked about Job. He talked about Noah. He talked about Moses. He talked about some of the great prophets. He never mentioned Jabez. The minor prophets never mentioned Jabez. The major prophets never mentioned Jabez. He's never talked about historically ever again. He's never talked about politically from that moment moving forward. Revelation says nothing about him. Peter says nothing about him. Paul writes 14 books of the Bible, most from prison, never says a word about Jabez. You think he hadn't read the Old Testament? He was a doctor in the law. He knew who Jabez was. He's never mentioned again. But he is mentioned before this. One other time in the Bible. And it's interesting that although it comes before this chronologically, Historically, it takes place after this. And what I mean by that is because we read the Bible so quickly, we don't pay attention to the, to the subdivisions, the way that it's divided up. Because what it does for the first part, it talks about people, but it talks about the places that are based on those people. 
And then it goes back to the people again. So just because it's mentioned before him is not any bearing that it's some sort of you know, historical inaccuracy. No, inaccuracy. What it's telling us is that Jabez was a real man. And just before it talks about how real of a man he was, it tells us about a place in the Bible that bears his name. Because what God is trying to get us to understand is that here's a man that we would say the, the deck was stacked against him. All odds were against Jabez. But do you know that Jabez went out from that moment and started a city that bore his name in the land of Judah? And history will tell you that it was one of the most educated cities in the land of Judah. I'll prove it to you. Look what the Bible says. Chapter 2, back up just for a moment. First Chronicles chapter 2. <clears throat> Verse 55. And the families of the scribes, shout scribes. That was the writers and the editors of the Bible. These aren't stupid people. And the families of the scribes which dwelt at, what's the next word? A man whose name meant failure became so successful that he started a city that bore his name, that the families of the writers of the word of God that we have in our lap and on this pulpit this morning lived at and wrote the word of God from a town that was named after a loser. Huh? Man, if I gave you invitation right there, it'd be enough. We didn't got to verse 10 yet. That's all introduction. Every bit of it. Had nothing to do with the message, but everything to do with it. Because we had to set it up. A man whose father is absent and mother wishes he was absent. I wish you were never born. Well, he is. What are you going to do about it? I'm going to name him sorrowful one, painful one. He's brought pain. He's rejected. I wish I could abandon him. And he grew up with that tagline of identification his whole life. Fingers pointing his face his whole life. And never once do we find him using it as an excuse. And never again is he mentioned. And yet he goes out and starts a city where the families of those that write the word of God are so magnetically drawn. There was something about the place that Jabez named after himself. You see, I, I find it interesting, and I'm just thinking of this before I get to the next verse. That names are so incredibly powerful that you would think Jabez would go out and start a city in Judah, found an area in Judah, and he would have named it something different. But he didn't. He kept his name because names in the Bible are extraordinarily important. We know the names of God. Matthew 121, what did the angel tell Mary? Thou shalt call his name Jesus, comma, for he shall save his people from their sins. The very definition of Jesus means Savior. Names are important. And he goes out and he founds a city that God unbelievably blesses, and it's the only thing we know about this guy, except for verse 10. And out of biblical obscurity, God tells us this about this man, Jabez. And Jabez, the sorrow-filled, painful one that brings heartache to everybody around him. That Jabez. And Jabez called on the God of Israel. Notice, Jabez did not vomit passive-aggressive posts on social media to get pity from people. Stop that nonsense. Everybody knows who you're talking about. And they don't care. You're making yourself look stupid. People say things like this. Well, you know, I, I know I probably shouldn't say that. Stop typing right there. Do you know how often, and I mean, shout the word often. You know how often the Holy Spirit says, you delete that right now. I mean, there are times I've done a full-blown video, wide slam open, heaven bound with a hammer down, mash the gas. I'm going to melt your face off with gasoline. And about the time I hit post, the Holy Ghost says, delete it. 
And there have been many a times the backspace has been the most repentive button on my keyboard. Okay, 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 I get it, right? And some of you spend so much time vomiting out how bad your life is, it'll never get any better. Because you say silly things like this, and by the way, you curse yourself. I remind you, death and life's in the power of the tongue. Well, my marriage is just never going to get any better. You are exactly right, 100,000%. You're exactly right, and I can't help you with that. Because your own word has witched you. Well, you know, I'm just, I, I'm just never going to feel better. I'm always going to feel sick. Yep, and that's why you're a hypochondriac and you're scared of everything. That's why you sneeze and you think you've got stage four cancer. And by the way, let me, let me, let me set some of you free with that. That's not spiritual. I don't know where we got this idea that the more we look sick and the more we feel sick, the more spiritual we should be. By his stripes, we are healed. If you ain't sick, don't act sick so you can get pity. I'd rather pat you on the back because you've been healed in the name of Jesus than pat you on the back because you're pretending. Anyhow, he could have gritched, complained, criticized, been mad, been upset. But notice, and Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed. Yeah. I, I'm not trying to impress you. I'm trying to impact you as your shepherd. The word oh there, now we look at that, we're like, oh, oh, oh. The word oh there in the original language, it's written as if it were an exclamation point. It's emphatic. He says, oh, with everything I've got. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Psalm 103, verse 1. That's the same word, oh. There, there's an earnest. There's an anticipation. There's an expectation about what comes next. And by the way, when you come to church, you ought to have a holy expectation and a holy anticipation because the reason God never does anything for you at church, it's not the church's problem. It's because you come to church with no expectation of God showing up. You better get you some, oh, oh, oh. He said, oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed. Notice, he's not like, well, you know, Lord, I'm never going to make it. They're right. I'm a failure. <laughs> uh -uh. He's like, let me tell you what I need. I need the blessing of God. I don't need their blessing. I don't need their permission. I don't need their approval. I don't need their ordination certificate. I don't need their money. I don't need their backing. I don't need their platform. I don't need their stuff. There's one thing I need, the blessing of God. The blessing of God. Let me tell you something. If you have the blessing of God, they can shut down every platform you stand on and God will give you 15 more. They can't never shut down. It's a fact. The blessing of God resides upon those of us that are number one, faithful, and number two, fervent and want it in our life. Do you want to be blessed of God? I'm so tired of the church. You see, the prosperity gospel, which is not a gospel. It's a perversion. The prosperity gospel has so spooked us that we're afraid to talk about the blessings of God in church. You ought to want to live under the spout where the glory comes out. You ought to want the blessing of God in your family. You kidding me? I'm not talking about money, cars, and big houses, and insurance liability. I'm talking about the blessing of God. I know people that live under the blessing, and they're poor as Job's turkey. You see, we've made blessing about money. Well, how do you know you're blessed? Well, I got bling for the king. I know people got bling for the king going to go to hell. Right? So when we talk about blessings, we get all twisted. We get all sideways. No. What we want is the power and the glory and the presence of God to absolutely cover us in every area of our life. Jesus said it like this. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they, and the word they means they and they alone, they shall be filled. So who gets filled? Those that hunger and those that thirst. So the question then becomes is why aren't we hungry and why aren't we thirsty? Because we're so full of the culture's garbage that when we come to the table of God's meat and potatoes, for he has meat that we know not of, we're already so filled to overflowing that we don't want to eat. Let me explain it to you like this. <coughs> Since Hudson and Lily moved out of town, I can throw Hudson under the bus. Amen. <laughs> so my oldest boy, Hudson, and he may still have a bit of a desire for this, but when he was growing up, he had an insatiable addiction to Skittles. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I know you can go down here to Circle B and you can get like 15 different bags of colors. They have, they have mint Skittles, chocolate Skittles, frozen Skittles, all kind of weird stuff today, right? 
But he would only eat Skittles out of a red bag. That's it. I'm telling it, Jason. He would only eat Skittles out of a red bag. It's like carnal Baptists only smoke camel, right? And so, <laughs> <clears throat> so he would only eat them out of the red pack. And I would find them stupid Skittles everywhere. I lived down here in Kelsey Glen for a while. And I mean, I would literally go in my office. I would pull a book off the shelf and there'd be a bag of Skittles open behind the book. I would go into the bathroom, open the cabinet, looking for something, and there's a bag of open Skittles in the cabinet in the bathroom. Who eats Skittles in the bathroom? They would be in the car. They would be in the garage. They would be everywhere. I used to be a chaplain for the Metropolitan Police Department, volunteer chaplain. I did it for a couple of years. One night I came home, and I was you know, going to eat and just, you know, take my police clothes off and get my pastor and hat on and run up here to the church. So we had this big thing on the table. There's all this food. And I, I noticed, you see, all the other kids, there's a finickiness about them. But Hudson, he, he normally eats pretty good. I mean, he's like 47 feet tall. And so he's got to eat something to fill up him legs, praise God. <clears throat> and so he's sitting there and he's just kind of picking the plate scraping the plate kids learned a long time ago i say kids i'm 48 and i do it if you push it around on the plate it looks like you've eaten more than you've actually eaten <laughs> and you can fake it till you make it right and throw it away when nobody's looking or give it to the dog praise god because that's what they're good for so he's really not paying any attention to this food and i was like hey ht time to eat i nah, just i'm just i'm just not real hungry were you sick no uh what, what do you mean did, did did you eat a bunch of food today nah I said, lean up here, son, I'll look at you. Now, he's just a little bitty old scutter when this happens, right? He leans up into the light on this big top, tall table we had, and the chandelier hit him just right. And what did my wondering eyes behold? Out of both sides of his mouth, glistening Skittle juice coming forth from his lips. No wonder you ain't hungry, <laughs> brat. You've been eating so much, so much junk, you can't be hungry for what you need to be nourished by. And we can think that's cute and we can laugh at it, but it's the way the church is in America. When the Holy Ghost turns the light on, you got two streams of Skittle juice running out of both sides of your mouth and you can't enjoy the Bible because you've been eating the devil's garbage. And I'm telling you, it's time that we say, God, fill us with your blessings. My cup runneth over. Oh, how I want to be blessed of God. I'm not interested in being blessed of man. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, don't care about platforms, don't care about millions of followers, who cares about blue check marks. Big deal, they're going to take it all away one day, and I'm going to, you know what, roll up my sleeves and fight the Antichrist like I ain't never fought nobody. Like a raging running buzzsaw. And we think, oh, we've got to have the approval of man. Some of you don't have the blessing of God because you're seeking the approval of man. You have what I call the disease to please, and you so want to fit in with them that you won't go without the camp so you can be where Jesus is, Hebrews teaches us. Because Jesus ain't in the crowd. He's without the camp. He's without the camp. And he said, oh, would you bless me? Now watch this. And enlarge my coast. I used to read more commentaries than I do now, but it began to discourage me. Because I began to realize the old timers were correct when they said, when you read a commentator, you have to be reminded that he is just that. He is a commentator, just like you and just like me. And I have read some ridiculous, dare I say, stupid renditions of what people think the Bible actually says. And I'm convinced that a lot of people don't care what the Bible says. They care what they say, so they just pretend that that's what the Bible says. That's how you get a cult, by the way. That's why some of you were raised in the traditions of men being taught for the commandments of God. So I was reading one of these commentaries, and it said, in essence, what Jabez was praying for was more real estate acquisition. Are you kidding me? What commentary meth do you have to smoke to be that ridiculous biblically? 
I smoked a lot of dope before I got saved, but I've never been that high or that stupid to read that into the text that is not there. Clearly, it's not there. I want more real estate acquisition. No, when he says enlarge my coast, he is referring to the borders and the expansion of his life, his anointing, his calling, his ministry. Isaiah 44 says it this way, enlarge our tent. Enlarge the streams and the place, the canvas of your dwelling. He's not referring to, oh, I want to get on, you know, Craigslist or whatever and acquire more property so I'll seem blessed. He's saying, Lord, because you bless me, now what I need you to do is take that blessing and use me for the glory of God. Use me. You see, what good is a blessing that you selfishly keep for you? It ends up not being a blessing but a blistering because if you do not like a sponge take what you need nutritionally and yet then be wrung out upon others then you're going to get to a place where the Old Testament priests got where Eli and his sons got and God condemned them and killed all three of them for it. He said you have become fat and rich on the blessings of God and you have fed yourself but my sheep have you not fed. And that's where the church in America is. We think the blessing of God is so we can look rich. Look, if God gives you money, spend it for the glory of God. Use it. I don't care. That's between you and God. But God ain't some genie in a bottle and some Chinese fortune cookie that you just get to pull out of a cookie and say, oh, yeah, so I'm blessed. I'm blessed and I'm highly favored. You know, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You ever notice that when these so-called prophets, and we know what real prophets look like. You ever notice a lot of these so-called prophets, every time they prophesy every year, it's 2020, it's 2021, it's 2022, it's 23, 24. They'll be doing it if Jesus tarry in 2085. This year, I feel like you're going to be anointed and highly favored. If you are saved and walking with God, you're anointed and highly favored. You don't need some false prophet to tell you that on TikTok. I want one of these prophets to get up and start calling names and say, you better repent of your adultery. You better repent of your godlessness. You better repent. You better repent. You better repent. I saw this guy the other day on Facebook. He was commenting on something. I ain't got time to deal with this, but I'm going to deal with it just for a second. He was commenting on something. And he said, uh, I am a queer witch, whatever that is. That's straight up confusion is what that is. I'm a queer witch, okay? That's cool. You can be whatever you want to be. You can be whatever you pretend to be. You can shop at Target all you want to, right? You can do all you want. He said, I'm a, I'm a queer witch. And then went on this whole paragraph. I got it on my phone. Screenshot. Went on this whole big paragraph, right? And then right after it, somebody who ought to know better says, welcome, my brother. That's the problem with the church world. We just think everybody's saved. We think everybody's born again. We think everybody that's got a Bible under their arm, been raised in the South, and, and somehow or another passed a Baptist church in their car 40 years ago, has somehow now been born again. I'm here to tell you heaven is going to be sweet and hell is going to be big. It's going to be big. And I'm saying to myself, where is the generation of people that will stand up and say, the blessing of God is for you to be used by God, not for you to abuse other people. When God gives you a platform, use it for his glory and for his honor. You know, sometimes these lights I can't really see, but I, I, don't, I don't think I'm, I'm too blind. Is that, is that Bo? That's Bo did it right there. He's, he made a cameo in the movie. This young man right here, how old are you, Bo? 21. 21 years old. TikTok can't stand him. I don't even know if he's still got a TikTok page. That's how I found him. But no, no TikTok. I know he's all over YouTube and, and, and play. Listen, he is a lion. I didn't even know he's going to be here today. He lives up in the Cook Valeria. He's a lion. I watched a video of this, this cat a while back. I think Isaiah Saldivar even shared it. He walks up into this, this affirming church. We a God-affirming church around here is where we are. Right? He walks up into this affirming church. Got the rainbow, pretty flag, and all that bunch of mess. And this guy walks up in here with a camera and a microphone, like four people, right? 
He walking up in there interview, and I mean, they got so mad. This little old deacon, he put his hands on it. They're pushing him out. I mean, they went nuts. And I'm like, where's the generation of guys like that and girls like that who will be so blessed and so used? They say, I don't care what the culture says. TikTok like me, TikTok not like me. It don't matter. I'm going to prophesy truth to the nations. Tell me where they are. So all of that to say, here's this guy that most people would have discounted, and he's like, you know what? I don't want to be blessed for my sake. I want to be blessed for your sake. Where are those people? Let me tell you something about being used of God. When God uses you, it will become the most healthy addiction that you have ever been involved in. The Bible even says when it came to the ministry of the Apostle Paul that Priscilla and Aquila and others that were with him and founded churches in their house, it says, and they, quote, addicted themselves to the ministry. That's a good addiction. That, that, that ain't pharmacia, that's spirituality. They addicted themselves to the ministry. You see, when God uses you to lead someone to Christ, when God uses you to turn someone's heart, when God uses you to speak a do word in its right season and it changes somebody's life, when God uses you to generously bless somebody, it will so humble you that the God of heaven would see fit to use you, me, or any of us collectively or individually that you will get so addicted, you'll say, God, use me every restaurant I go to. Use me every car lot I park in. Use me every time I get gas. Use me every time I go to buy Buy a, a t-shirt and blue jeans. Use me everywhere I go. Use me online. Use me on the phone. Use me offline. Use me standing. Use me laying down. Just use me. Use me. Use me, God. And that should be the prayer of your heart. Bless me. Use me. Ring me out upon other people. Because you have a choice, and it's a pretty good choice. It's a very simple choice. It may sound crass, but it's the truth. Here's what you can do with your life. You can go through life being used by everybody but God. Don't do that. Stop letting people use you for their nefarious plans and let God use you for his kingdom expansion. Can I get a witness? Shout hallelujah. <laughs> oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed. Enlarge my coast. Give me more spiritual territory. Let me read more, pray more, fast more, do more, reach more. And now watch this. And that thine hand might be with me. That should be your daily prayer. Lord, lead me. Let your hand be on me, Lord. Show me the direction. Be like the servant of Abraham. I being in the way, the Lord led me. Don't deviate to the left. Don't deviate to the right. Stay balanced. A false balance is abomination of the Lord. Just stay right in the middle and say, God, today lead me, guide me. Holy Spirit, go before me. Prepare the way. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, but the stops of a good man are ordered by the Lord too because he'll step you and stop you. Psalm 46 and verse 10. In this world in which we go, 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 run, 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 sweat, 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 sweat. God said, be still. Stop and know that I'm God. You know why we don't know he's God? We're not being still. We're running around like chickens with our head cut off. We think that busyness is spirituality. I know busy people that have no spirituality. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just sit down, take a nap, read a Bible, rest, relax, turn your phone off, turn your apps off, and just sit there in the presence of God and say, Lord, I need you to lead me. I've got some decisions that I've got to make. And by the way, everyone in this room has decisions that they need to make. And the problem in James chapter number four was the Bible says, they said, go to now ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeared for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, shout therefore. Therefore, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. You know what that verse just told us? I, I know, we've heard that verse. Well, you know, the Bible says that uh, if, if you know to do right, but you don't do right, that's sin. Well, duh, we know that. We're not that ridiculous, that being the operative word. He's being very specific in James 4, 17. He says, if you know to do what you should do with your life and your time, but you waste your life and your time, it is a sin. It is a sin. And you know how many decisions we make in life? Never consulting God. Think about the daily routine 
of how many times you could seek God's wisdom, James 1, 5, because we need it, but you don't. Think about that. I promise you, you will never regret seeking God's wisdom in a decision, but you will always regret not seeking it. You ought to read sometime, and again, I don't, I don't have time to develop all this, but you ought to read sometime the book of Joshua. Joshua came in to conquest the land. Dozens, multiple dozens of families and generations and people he had to be called by God to come in and destroy place after place after place after place, name after name. And when he was doing that, the Bible says that there was a group of people that lived very close to their border named the Gibeonites. But the Gibeonites pretended that they lived a long, 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 long way away. And so they made their shoes look like they were worn out, made their clothes look like they were wore out. They took their water and made it stale and moldy looking as well as their bread to make it seem as if they had taken a long journey when in actuality they lived in Lebanon. Right? They're like 12 miles away, 15 tops. So they show up to make a league with Joshua and the Israelites so that they won't be destroyed. And the Bible says that the people looked at their clothes and looked at their water and looked at their bread. And the Bible says they took of their stuff and inquired not at the mouth of the Lord. And they made a league with people that they had already been commanded to destroy. And that crowd to this day is still fighting them in a war in Israel in real time right now. You will always regret not seeking the wisdom of God and saying, Lord, lead me today. Lead my marriage today. Lead my kids today. Lead me, lead me, lead me. And by the way, stop all this nonsense that God's going to lead you apart from what the Scripture says. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. How does he direct me? Through the directions. So don't ever follow anybody, even if it's me. Don't ever follow anybody that says something like this. Well, you know, I know what the Bible says, but. Now you keep your butt out of the Bible. Amen? Keep your butt out of it. I know what the Bible says, but I know what I experienced. Look. I'm all for experience. We're charismatic. If your experience goes beyond the realm of Scripture, your experience is wrong. I don't care how big your goosebumps were. I don't care what you saw, what you heard. If it goes beyond the truth of Scripture, your experience has trumped Scripture. Now, here's what a lot of these cessationist people, and that's a demonic doctrine. Here's what a lot of these people say. They say, well, you know... Um, Charismatics, Pentecostals, whatever you want to call people, right? We're a Bible church. That's all that matters. I hate them name tags of identification. Denominations done nothing but cause man-made division in the body of Christ. It's nothing but a curse. They say, well, you know, your problem is you, you elevate your experience over your theology. Now, there are a lot of people that do that, and they're wrong, but we don't do that. You know what we do? We experience our theology, and there is a big difference. There is a big difference. There is a big difference. But you can never be led astray by making sure that you're faithfully in the Word of God. That's why as a pastor, as your friend, as a shepherd, I just keep saying, listen, I don't care how much criticism you get. Well, you're just reading it too fast. Well, they're not reading it at all. You will retain when you read God is faithful. The Word of God will go from your eyes and your mind into your heart. It'll change you. You'll start dreaming different. You'll start acting different. You'll stop retaliating, and you'll start meditating. There's a difference. And if you want to be led by God, you are going to have to get under his leadership. So he says, Lord, bless me. Lord, use me. Lord, lead me. But then notice, he says this, and that thou wouldest, watch these next two words, keep me. Keep me. I love how the Bible just outlines itself in a verse that most people would never even look at. 
Bless me. Use me. Lead me. And dear God, keep me. Keep me from what? Look what he says. From evil. The Bible says to keep us from the hour of temptation. Deliver us from evil. Listen, God wants to lead you so he can protect you and keep you from what he knows is ahead of you. You don't know what's coming. He does. You see, you're sitting on a train and you can look out either window and that's about it. But God's got the sovereign, providential, theological helicopter view. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows where you've been, where you are, and he knows where you're headed. And you ain't got to worry about tomorrow because God's already been there and he said it's going to be all right. Sufficient under the day is the evil thereof. Stop fretting. Stop being full of fear. Stop worrying. God knows what's coming. And say, God, keep me from what's going to hurt me. If the devil would have had his way, he'd have killed you 15 times before you got to church this morning. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If God be for us, who can be against us? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. That's the promise of God. And we know his promises are yes and amen. Titus 1, 2, God cannot lie. It's not that he doesn't feel like it. He can't. It's against his nature. God cannot lie. He is holy, holy, holy. Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord, I change not. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's never lied, and he's never will. If you say, God, keep me, he will keep you from the hour of temptation that shall come upon the whole world, Matthew 24. He'll keep you. He'll keep you. He'll keep you from evil. And then he said this, keep me for this reason, that it may not grieve me. I find that interesting. He didn't have to put that there, but he did. He said, keep me from sin, it's important, that it may not grieve me. Now, we know that sin grieves God. If you believe sin grieves God, say amen. amen. Okay, we know sin grieves God. Read Psalm 32, read Psalm 38, read Psalm 51. It took David three psalms under inspiration to repent of his sin in 2 Samuel 11 with Bathsheba. Three psalms. But wait a minute. It's interesting to me. That in those psalms, he said, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be pure when thou judgest. Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. He, he was confessing, God, I know what I did. Hurt you. But you'll notice that's not what Jabez said. Words mean something. He didn't say, God, keep me from evil because it grieves you. He said, keep me from evil because at the end of the day, it grieves me. Yeah. Yeah. I love you enough to tell you something that a lot of preachers perhaps won't tell you, but it's the facts. If sin doesn't bother you, you're still lost in it. You won't be perfect when you get saved, but 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you will be different when you get saved. You will be a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But listen to me. If you can live in sin and it doesn't bother you, something's wrong. But how many of you, like me and many of you in this room, understand the fact that when you're a Christian and you get involved in any level of disobedience, no matter how big or how small, it'll keep you up at night. You'll be like, man, I... I, I didn't mean to lie, but I, I, I think I did. <laughs> right? You'll start freaking out about stuff in the right way. I'm going to tell you the most miserable person in this tent. Ready? I'm not going to call no names, so don't get nervous. <laughs> you know the most miserable person in this tent and online is? A person that professes to know Jesus, but in works they deny him. They live in sin and they won't deal with it. You see, you pretend like you're mad at everybody else, but you're really just mad at yourself because you can't say no to sin. Because Proverbs 1.10 says, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Consent thou not. You know what God said? Just say no. That was a long time around before the D.A.R.E. program showed up in the 80s. Just say no. That's what God said. Just say no. Just say no. Just say no. And a lot of people project their bitterness and their misery on everyone else and they pretend like they're mad at everyone else but really they're mad at the person they look at in the mirror because they, they, they can't say no. You know what sin will do? It'll grieve you. Sin will make you old for you're supposed to be old. 
Sin will put you in the ground for you're supposed to be put in the ground. Hebrews chapter 13, the Bible talks about the chastening of God. Let me tell you something. Cemeteries all over America are filled with Christians that died premature deaths because they wouldn't get right with God. Sin should grieve you because it grieves God. And Ephesians 4.30 says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So if you are full of the Holy Spirit, whatever grieves Him should grieve you. Does that make sense? And there's a problem with people that can keep sinning and never be bothered by it. I've had a number of people through the years, and even at our church, and especially men, because men struggle with various things. And they say things like, oh, you know, Pastor, I just feel like every week I'm coming to the altar for the same thing and for the same thing and for the same thing and for the same thing, and I, I just don't know what to do with that. Let me tell you something. I am not bothered by the person that is continually bothered by their sin. I'm bothered by the person that's never bothered by their sin. They never come to the altar. They never say they're sorry. They never repent. They never shed a tear. They never have to get before the Lord and say, God, cleanse me. I'm wrong. And so the person that keeps confessing, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, continually cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I am not against the person that's bothered by their sin. I am against the man or woman that is never bothered by their sin. And I can preach on anything and they never move. I know people that come to good churches. I could crank every heater in this town up and make it 200 degrees in this room and preach on hell so hot it would melt the LED wall. And there would still be people sit in this tent with a, eh, meh, <laughs> Let me tell you something. You are haphazardly about to trip right into the lake of fire. If sin and Bible conviction never stirs you, something's wrong. I was telling Julian last night before we had the one-year anniversary of GV Espanol, he, he was asking me about certain things in my life and why certain things just don't bother me that would bother the average person. And I said, because there's a difference in people that live by convenience and people that live by conviction. If you live by convenience, you will bend. If you live by conviction, you will die. And the church is full of bendy people. You have no conviction. You just have conviction. You believe because it's convenient to believe. Yeah, but wait till religion and politics is brought up at the family reunion and see if you bend then. Right? Oh, yes, I'm standing true. Oh, really? Wait till they try to shut the church down in round two and see how true you're standing. Now, you know we will. They'll bring Cobra helicopters and tanks up in this place before we uh, shut down. They can have it, a bunch of nonsense. But listen, you have to understand something. There's a difference in people that have convictional values and just casual, comfortable values. And this man said, Lord, Please keep me from evil so that it does not grieve me. I don't want to live with that broken fellowship with God. And please understand something. Stop listening to people that tell you every single time disobedience creeps into your life, you got to get saved, get saved, get saved. The Bible says you must be born again, not again, again, and again, and again, and again. If you get saved, it doesn't give you a legal right to live in sin. It gives you a legal right to live in sanctification. Somebody says, well, do you, do you believe in once saved, always saved? No, I believe in truly saved, always saved. If you are saved, you will live like you are saved because you are saved. That's the difference. Stop giving people a pass. That it may not grieve me. You see, when you got saved, you got a fixed relationship. Nobody can do anything about that. But you don't have fixed fellowship. You have a fixed relationship, but you got to work on fellowship. James 4, 8, draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first. Notice the, the, the idea is that I take the initiative to do those things because God's always waiting to respond to my fellowship. And so listen, 
I have a relationship with my children that they can't do anything about because relationally we're connected. But we have to work on our fellowship every day. You can have a son or a daughter that has a relationship with you that you haven't talked to in 30 years. Because you don't have to button up the relationship. You got that till you're both dead. You got to firm up the fellowship. And that's where people get it twisted. And if you have a relationship with your heavenly father, you will want to work on your fellowship with your heavenly father every single day. End of the verse. We're done. Thank you for letting me preach a little longer today. I felt that it was just good. I just, I just wanted to teach today. I just wanted to help you. Now watch what it says at the end of verse 10. And God, not man, not pulling himself up by his bootstraps. No, no, And God granted him, Jabez, that which he requested. How come we miss that reading of this one and this one and that one and that one and that place and that place? And, no, 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 no. And God granted him that which he requested. And he got my red button. Boop. He's already came up here. Praise God. Now listen to me. What that means is entirely simple. If you came here today looking for some deep, notable theological truth, it's right there in the Bible. It's right there. It's so simple. It's deep, simple. Ready for it? Here's what God said. All right, Jabez, what do you want from me? Bless me. Use me, lead me, keep me. That's a tall order. That's a tall order for any of us. And God said, okay. If you ask so, Asking it shall be given you, seeking you shall find, knocking it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, to him that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Matthew 7, 7, 8, 9. Ye have not because ye call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. You know why you don't see great and mighty things? Because you ain't asking. It's very plain. You know what we would call this passage? I would call it the man that got God's attention. He didn't have anybody else's attention. He was a loser. He was a sorrow filled pain bringing man by his very name that called on God to be blessed used led and kept and God set up on his throne as it were and says I'll do it because you asked me and a man that the world counted out left from there with the blessing of God shrouded upon his life and he went and started a city named Jabez which still has the same meaning, painful one, painful place. And it became the very place that the families of the writers of the Bible resorted and were magnetized to. Because no matter what the enemy has put in your path, no matter what the culture has put in your face, there is a God of he in heaven that desires to answer the requests of his children and may it be said of every man, woman, and child in this room that God granted them that which they requested and I wonder how many of you right now whether it's one, two, ten, a hundred I don't care, everybody online in our hubs I wonder how many of you right now would leave your seat and not be embarrassed to come and fall at this altar and say God, that's my prayer not just today, but every day God bless me, use me, lead me God keep me from sin keep my marriage from sin and chaos may the blessing of God flow from heaven upon my life put your hand upon me lead me every day guide me every day make me a man of the word a woman of the word a young person of the word give me a passion give me a desire for the things of God Jabez called on the God of Israel he could have done anything he could have given up thrown in the towel don't, don't, don't. There's a God on his throne that wants to hear and answer the requests of his children in accordance to his word. So you come right now. Just spend some time with the Lord. Maybe some of you need to confess some of that grievous sin that's been in your life. 
some shady business deal, some lie that you told your spouse or somebody else or some rebellion in your heart, something you've been looking at, some place you've been, somebody you've been hanging out with, some bitterness in your soul, some, some agony. And it's been grieving you. Come and lay it down. It don't have to grieve you anymore. David said, Lord, restore unto me the bones which thou hast broken that I may rejoice. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Some of you are saved. God bless you. You are saved, but you've been living miserable. Ask God to give you your joy back. Give you your peace back. The fullness of the Holy Ghost, give it to you back. People online, everybody in the hubs right now, wherever you're at, just fall on your face before God and say, God, this is what I want. Maybe some of you need to write this down. Maybe you ought to put this on a three by five card. Put it in your phone as a reminder to pop up every day before you go to bed. I don't know. Bless me. Use me. Lead me. Keep me. Bless me. Use me. Lead me. Keep me. Put it online. Make a good shirt. Make a good hat. Bless me. Use me. Lead me. Keep me. You say, will it work? I don't know. Ask Jabez. And God granted him <laughs> that which he requested. Now you take as long as you need. We have prayer team members that will pray for you if you need help. You slip up your hand. If you need somebody to pray over you today for healing. need somebody to pray over you today for you're just in torment for deliverance. You take your time. We never dismiss in a service. We just say, we'll see you next service. We never have official dismissal. People can come and go as they need to. To my right, your left, we have our baptismal booth set up. We have some little changing areas. If you're here today and you're following the Lord, I know some people get saved online. They drive here for their, their pastor to baptize them. We're going to do that today. We're going to be right over there. You just slip over to my right, your left, and you begin to get in line. Miss Billy is there with the crew, and they'll get you a towel. They'll get you a name tag, and we'll let you follow the Lord publicly for what you've already in your life and heart done privately before the Lord. I don't care if you've been saved one day or 50 years. If you've never been water baptized, the Bible says that's your next step of obedience. It's what believers do. We follow him. It's the next step in discipleship. You can't leapfrog that discipleship step. You get saved, you follow the Lord in believer's baptism. And so we'll be lining up to do that here in just a moment. They're going to just begin to worship. You take as long as you need in prayer. I'm going to invite you to stand all over the room. If you need to slip out, that's fine. We'll see you Wednesday night for our regular service. Men, don't forget, we'll have our Bible study 6 a.m. on Wednesday morning, not tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. Wednesday morning. My wife and I will be at Prayer Mountain for a day and a half just seeking the face of the Lord and seeing what He has for our church and for His kingdom. So we're just going to pray. We're just going to worship. We're going to go over to the baptismal booth. We're just going to let the Lord have his way. We love you guys. We're honored that you're here today. You stay as long as you like. You slip out, whatever you need to do. May the Lord get glory today in this place. Don't forget, everybody, this Saturday, um, the 17th at 3 p.m., we have Family Day. Make sure you come and join us for our first ever Family Day. That will be this Saturday at 3 p.m. We will have walking tacos, I believe, and like hot dogs and stuff. We're going to be playing Minute to Win It games with the family, so we want you to join us. And also next Sunday after church, February 18th at 4 p.m. is Serve Day. If you want to figure out how to get plugged in here at Global Vision to be a volunteer. Make sure you are here next Sunday at 4 p.m.